Welcome. I'm Joshua Sparrow at the Brazelton Touchpoint Center, and this is Learning to Listen, Conversations for Change. To find out more about the Brazelton Touchpoint Center and Learning to Listen, just go to brazeltontouchpoints.org and click on Learn with Us and look for Learning to Listen in the Conversations section. There's also a link there to our archive of Learning to Listen conversations that go back to 2019. To learn more about and register for more Brazelton Touchpoint Center conversations, events, and trainings, click on the link that you'll find in the chat, learn.brazeltontouchpoints.org. To join the Brazelton Touchpoint Center's learning network, look for the btc-learning-network link in the chat now. And if you are able and would like to help us continue to make programming like Learning to Listen free and available to all, please look for the donate link in the chat or the donate page at browsingtouchpoints.org backslash donate. Any amount, whatever you can do that would feel good for you is a huge help. Thank you for joining us. Today, we will be learning with Susan Lin, lecturer in psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and research associate at Boston Children's Hospital and author of several books on how we can protect children from the harms caused by the commercialization of childhood. But first, here's a bit of information about today's Learning to Listen episode. Over a thousand people have registered for today's webinar, and it's great to be seeing you all in the chat from all over the country. So please do go ahead and tell us who you are and where you're from and what you do in the chat. Today, once again, our superb interpreter, Maria Jose Gutierrez, joining us from Bogota, Colombia, will be simultaneously translating our webinar into Spanish. Thank you, Maria Jose. To access the translation, click on the interpretation icon in your Zoom controls. Then select Spanish. To mute the English in the background, select mute original audio. La conversación de hoy será en español e inglés. En los controles de reunión, haga clic en la interpretación. Haga clic en el idioma que le gustaría escuchar. Para escuchar solo el español, haga clic en silenciar audio original. We are also providing closed captions today for those who would like to use them. To turn captioning on, please click on the closed caption icon in your Zoom controls and select show subtitle. You can adjust the size of the subtitles. Please use the chat feature if you have a comment to share or need help with a technical issue. Please do put your questions for Susan Lin in the Q&A box and we will try to pause a few times along the way to respond to them. Now, we know many of you may be wondering about certificates of attendance. If you would like to receive a certificate of attendance for today's webinar, please be sure you complete the feedback survey. The feedback survey will open in your web browser when this webinar ends. You will also receive a link to the survey tomorrow in our thank you email to you that will include a link to the webinar recording, as well as resources about today's conversation and that survey so you can get your certificate of attendance. The survey and webinar recording will be available in both English and Spanish. You can also access the recordings on our YouTube channel and on our website, that's brazeltontouchpoints.org. Before we begin, I want to thank our sponsor, the Burke Foundation, and our Brazelton Touchpoint Center production team, Isabella Mantilla, Ashley Gaddis, Michael Accardi, and Suzanne Okasik. Thank you all. And now I'd like to introduce today's guest, Susan Lin. Susan Lin, a psychologist and author and an award-winning ventriloquist, is a world-renowned expert on creative play and the impact of tech and commercial marketing on children. Dr. Lin's books have been praised in publications as diverse as the Wall Street Journal, Mother Jones, and the New York Times. A passionate advocate for children, Dr. Lin was the founding director of Campaign for a Commercial Free Childhood, now called Fair Play, 
from 2000 to 2015. And we will put a link to Fair Play in the chat as well. Dr. Lin has lectured on the importance of creative play, the impact of tech, media, and marketing on children, and on puppetry as a therapeutic tool throughout North America and in South America, Asia, Europe, the Middle East, and Australia. Dr. Lin is internationally known for her use of puppets as therapeutic tools for children. She pioneered this work at Boston Children's Hospital and the Children's AIDS Program, where she used puppets to help children cope with illness, hospitalization, death, loss, and other life challenges. Dr. Lynn and her puppets appeared in several episodes of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. She has written and appeared in a number of video programs designed to help children cope with issues ranging from mental illness to death and loss, and most recently, stresses caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Susan Lynn, thank you so much for joining us today. Josh, I'm so happy to be talking with you. Me too. So um, Sus Susan and I have known each other for many decades. We won't say how many. <laughs> and it is just such a delight to see you again. I just have to say, first of all, this book is so important. And I'm so glad that I get to do this with you because it meant I got to spend the whole weekend reading this book. And it is really a must. Uh, it is a must read. You are um, a hero for me. And um, I thought maybe we could start out by having you tell us if it's OK, a little bit about you and um, about your journey to your courageous advocacy on behalf of children. Um, and like everybody who's joined us today, um, the way you are with children and the way you hold them um, is um, just so inspiring. And I've been thinking about how um, getting to this with you today is, is just brings a little bit of solace in these really challenging times just because of um, your commitment to an understanding of children. So tell us how, how you got here. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you so much. Um, you know, I began life as a ventriloquist. I mean, I started as a child and certainly as a child, um, play was so important to me. I mean, my best memories of my childhood are about um, all sorts of creative and dramatic Play. So I started with that foundation. And then um, I earned my living for a lot of years as, you know, performing for kids and also playing with children using puppets, as you said, to help them talk about all sorts of difficult issues. Um, and somehow I've I've always believed that um, the well-being of children is really um, should trump just about everything, you know, and if we lived in a world that really valued children, a lot of the problems that we have in this world wouldn't be happening. So that's kind of what's always, you know, motivated me, but it's also um, my delight and awe in um in children's development i mean it's it's just a miracle i happen my um my daughter has now a seventh seven month old and just being able to witness this little baby's development is astonishing and how she practices her new skills just all by herself I mean, she recently learned how to sit up. And when I was there, she was throwing herself back against a pillow and sitting up and throwing herself back. So um, in, the, in the 1980s, um, what happened is that <clears throat> television was deregulated. Children's television was deregulated. It became fine to create a program for the sole purpose of selling toys. And at the same time, communication technologies were just evolving at kind of breakneck speed. So we had the development of this amazing 
seductive, addictive technology and really no regulations or virtually no regulation for it. And by the 1990s, um, I was working at Judge Baker Children's Center and um, it became clear to me, I was working with Alvin Poussant, who's a wonderful, amazing child psychiatrist. And um, he had started a media center at Judge Baker. And so it became clear to me that we couldn't talk about media without talking about advertising and marketing. And as the more I looked into it, the more concerned I became um, that the values, um, advertising doesn't just sell products, it sells values and behaviors. And the values and behaviors that advertising and marketing sells, um, materialism, uh, me first, selfishness, basically. I mean, they're not good for children. They're not good for the world. And that's when I and my colleagues started Campaign for a Commercial Free Childhood. We look at advertising and marketing to kids as an issue of social justice. And basically it's about the rights of children to grow up and the freedom for parents to raise them without being undermined by greed. Um, so that's kind of how it all began. Thank you, Susan. You know, one of the wonderful things about your book, and you just demonstrated to us when you talked about your granddaughter, um, is what a what a wonderful observer you are of children and how children are talking to you um, before they have words. Right. So to and you start off your book that way, and then you talk about the kinds of opportunities for play that children need so that a certain set of values emerge that are really antithetical to the greed and materialism that you just alluded to. So I, I wondered if we could sort of go back to the beginning and to talk about your, your vision for what play needs to be for children to grow and learn and flourish for the development of those attributes like curiosity and compassion and creativity, as well as self-regulation and critical thinking. What does play need to be like? And, and one of the things that I loved in the, in the first chapter was you brought back the revered British pediatrician and psychoanalyst, D.W. Winnicott, um, who we don't hear much about anymore, um, but whose work I think is deeply influenced all. So maybe tell us about um, where you, where you see play needing to be before we then go on to talk about what's happening to a digital technology and then what we need to do to mm -hmm. protect it. I mean, first of all, it's really important, I think, to remember that, that play, creative play, hands-on play, active play is the foundation of learning, creativity, constructive problem solving, and um, the capacity to wrestle with life to make it meaningful. And, um, and children's creative play um, is a window into their hearts and minds. Um, it's a gift to them and it's also a gift to us. And, and you know, for neurotypical kids, play comes naturally. Um, it, it, it's, they are born with the capacity to play and, um, and, and they will do that naturally if we let them do it. And, and you can't force somebody to play. You can't make them play. Play has to come from within. It has to come from um, an internal need for self-expression. And or be, or because you want to try something out. It's in play that kids experiment with with different roles. And and um and I I just think it's so, you know, people talk about, you know, you have to make learning fun and you know, we get sold that a lot. 
I mean, learning can be fun. It can also be intrinsically satisfying, even you know if it's if it's um, challenging. But I know in in um, in who's raising the kids, I I talk about a a video that my cousin sent me of her fourteen month old granddaughter, and honestly, when I saw that video, I got chills. I mean, Ariel, Ariel, right? Ariel, right. I, I get chills even talking about it. I mean, basically, here's this little girl and and she's sitting with these retro toys that marketers dismiss as so old fashioned and boring. I mean, an old baby doll and a stuffed bear and there's silence. And she's in the presence, you know, she's safe. She's in the presence of a caring adult and so she begins um, like just fingering the baby sort of, her hand goes up and down the baby and she comes upon the baby's toes and she feels the baby's toes. And then she puts her hands up to her ear. I mean, you can see her kind of thinking protuberances, you know? I, so <laughs> something sticking but, out somewhere, but what? <laughs> yeah, right. I know she wasn't thinking protuberances, but little <laughs> things sticking out, basically. <laughs> and so she's feeling the toes and she feels the baby's that she feels her ears, but something's not right. And then her hand goes up the doll and it comes to the doll's ears. She feels the doll's ear, she feels her own ear, she feels the doll's ear again, she feels both her ears. She does it one more time, and then she just goes on to something else. And that's just such an incredible example of human learning and, 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 and human creativity that is innate and, and so desperately needs an opportunity to be able to come out. And the problem that we have in this society is that we seem to be doing just about everything we can to prevent children from playing rather than encourage it. And there's all sorts of things that all of you know. I mean, you know, academics being pushed down to preschool. I mean, there's all, there's all of that play being, you know, wiped out of kindergarten, recess being canceled, all of those things. But um, another huge factor and the one that I'm, you know, that I've, I'm, you know, terribly concerned about is the commercialization of children's lives and the way that the combination of this amazing technology and, um, and unregulated corporations are really preventing children from doing what they need to do in order to lead healthy, satisfying lives. And with that old retro doll, as you said, it's a 3D object yes. and it's silent. It's not beeping or buzzing, right. seeing recorded things. And so there's all of this space and quiet for this 14 month old to be able to do the exploring right. and the figuring out that she's doing. And you start the book off that way. By the way, I should add, before you tell that story, I think um, in your introduction, you say, I am not here to make parents feel guilty yeah. about their use of digital technology. And if anybody in my generation tells you, oh, just turn off the thing, you should tell them you have no idea what it's like in today's digital environment. So that, that comes even before Ariel. But yes, but it's so okay. important. Yeah, it's so important. Yeah. I wanted you to tell one more story about <laughs> retro, retro um, toys that I think helps begin to sort of make the case for how digital technology is getting in the way. And that's the story you tell a little bit late in the book about when you give talks, you bring three puppets. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah, they're also just really helpful to understand like the ways in which mm -hmm. the way children can explore and create gets constrained, mm -hmm. if you wouldn't mind telling us that story. Yeah, and Josh, thank you for um, bringing up the part about not wanting to make parents feel guilty. Honestly, I don't think it's ever been harder to be a parent than it is today. You've got this culture 
that is, you know, really undermining your best efforts and and providing you with false information about what kids need. So I think it's really, really hard. And I begin um, all of the talks that I give by saying that um, because it's very, it's, I mean, parents feel guilty all the time. And, um, and this is a really hard one and they need help. I mean, you know, they need help from society. They need help from um, the people who work with kids. They need help from teachers. It's hard today to be a parent. Um, so, and now I forgot what the story was that you the wanted three, me to tell. The three puppets. Oh, one... oh, oh, right, the three puppets. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah, I begin um, to talk, to help people understand um, that when it comes to toys, really less is more. And the best toys, um, the saying goes, are 90% child and only 10% toy. And um, so I begin by bringing out a puppet that is like a creature, basically. It could, you know, and I ask the people, you know, in the audience to think about what is it, what's its name, and what does it say? And so what happens is that, and then I ask them to just call it out. And what happens is there, what the, what it is, this creature is just all over the map. It could be anything. And because the puppet isn't, I mean, as human beings, we, we, we are wired to make meaning. We have to make meaning. And, and so when we see something that isn't telling us what it is, we make it into something. And what we make it into is based on our unique life experience, because really that's all we have. So it's all over the map, the puppet's name, whether it's male, whether it's female, it could be anything. So then I bring out a puppet <clears throat> that is has a mane and you know two ears up here and ask people what it is and most people say it's a horse it's a donkey it's a mule um and so already their creativity is being stifled but um you still don't know whether it's male or female whether it's old or young there's still some room for creativity and then i bring out a puppet of the cookie monster. And the first thing that happens is everybody in the in the audience always goes, oh, you know, because people love the cookie monster. But then if I say, what is it? It's the cookie monster. What's its name? Cookie monster. What does it say? Me want cookie. Or maybe now it's saying me want vegetables. I'm not sure. <laughs> so, um, and it's not that the Cookie Monster is a bad character or anything like that, but if if um, if children spend a lot of time with tech and with screens, and then if their toys are all linked to the media that they consume, then um, they don't have opportunities for creativity. And I don't know if you've ever tried to ever played with a child who has a media character, but I have, and I and I've tried, you know, to create something new or to suggest something different. They get extremely indignant. I mean, they know there there's a script that comes, you know, with this toy. You know, so Susan, really I, I'd never thought of this before, but in working with kids who experience severe trauma, their play looks constricted in a similar way. And yeah. you just can't help them elaborate it. Right. Yeah. Um, because, yeah, and with kids with, you know, severe trauma, it may be too scary or, you know, who knows, right? I mean, yeah. it's true. Yeah. So, um, one one more um, uh, quote from your book to sort of set up how things need to be for children to flourish is actually a quote that you give from uh, someone whose name I will not pronounce correctly, 
Dacher Keltner, who's the oh, founding... Docker, Docker Keltner. Uh, yeah, yes. the founding director of the Greater Good Science Center, um, who um, is a pioneer in the study of awe. And um, you talk about awe in children as being part of why it's a delight to be in their company. But you quote him as saying, the experience of awe is about finding your place in the larger scheme of things. It is about quieting the press of self-interest. It is about folding into social collectives. It is about feeling reverential toward participating in some expansive process that unites us all and that ennobles our life's endeavors. And I, and I thought maybe before we go on to talk about what digital tech is doing to play, to think about children's experience of awe, when and how that happens and how that also prepares them to be humbled in a way, to be part of something bigger than themselves. Yeah, one, one of the things um, that I learned from Fred Rogers from the work that I did with him and is the importance of silence. And, and he, he really cared a lot about silence and and I hadn't thought about it before my conversations um, with him. Kids need silence. I mean, in order to play, they need time, they need space, they need inspiration, they need to be safe, and they need they need silence in order, first of all, to be able to listen to themselves and to differentiate themselves from the rest of the world, but also to take the time to be able to explore explore the world and really just marvel in its wonders. I mean, kids need time in nature, they need time outside, um, and, and they need to have opportunities to experience awe. So now <laughs> for, for the terrifying part of our <laughs> Oh, darn. <laughs> yeah. I know you oh, yeah, then to, there's the world. <laughs> yeah, we need to go to that beautiful place in, yeah. and hold on to it and then figure out how, to, how, do, how do we continue to hold on to it. But let's talk about w what's getting in the way. And um, there are so many different aspects of this that you lay out so clearly in, in your book. Um, so you take us where you want to go. You talk about Fortnite and Minecraft and about Echo Dot, um, which is, you know, terrifying in its own way, about prodigies. Yeah. Tell, us, okay. tell us what we need to know yeah. to protect our children in childhood. <laughs> Let me just start out by saying that I'm not anti-technology. I mean, I worked in television. Um, I'm doing a Zoom interview right now. I... I, I'm, you know, I, I text, I Skype, I do all sorts of things on online. I'm as addicted to my technology as anybody else is really. I mean, I recognize that. But um, it's not the technology itself, it, which, which is incredibly powerful and becoming more powerful and is potentially addictive, but it's the business model that's the problem. It's the business model. And the business model of the new technologies is, um, is to capture our attention and the attention of our children. And that's all that matters is capturing attention. And, and, and so that in itself is a terrible problem because it kind of means that whatever is going on as far as the business model is concerned is fine as long as people are glued to their screen. And, and so the, the, the content, including content for children, is designed to be purposely addictive. And, and, to, and to keep kids going. And, you know, the problem is that, uh, and one thing that's so annoying to me is that the tech, the tech for kids and the tech for young children, even the tech for babies, it's all um, marketed as being sensory now. 
if you go to YouTube, I find this so annoying. If you go to YouTube and just put in baby videos for babies, what comes up are all these videos marketing themselves as being sensory when, when really what young children need is to explore the world with all of their senses, not just to sit and watch something um, or to, you know, swipe and tap and, you know, and um, all of that. And these sensory videos, I mean, some of them actually claim to teach babies language, but what the research is telling us is that babies cannot learn language from a machine. They, it needs to be in a relationship with a human being. And one of the things that's happening with the new technologies that is so concerning is that basically what they are, are they're marketing themselves as being educational and without any, um, any laws that um, that make them prove that it's educational. You know, you can just say, you, you know, on Google Play or the Apple Store, you can just say this is educational. I mean, everything is educational, of course. It just depends on what it is that you're actually learning. So um, that's um, so so babies. So what's happening is this movement to, to convince people that technology can replace teachers, technologies can replace parents, really. And, and even today, there are social robots on the market that um, claim to teach kids social skills and you know to help them with homework and, and that kind of thing. So that's, um, that's, extremely troubling. Um, a machine is not a human being and and never will be a human being. So that's um, that's a concern. Um, in in the book, um, in I I have um, I I bought and I talk about um, the Echo Dot, which is Amazon's um, speaker for children. Like Alexa. Uh, yeah. It's like Alexa for children. It, yeah. It's it's Alexa. It, it provides Alexa. Thank you. It provides Alexa for children. Um, and, you know, first of all, uh, the Echo Dot, when it first came out, was just a machine. But now you can buy it either as a little baby tiger or a little baby panda. And honestly, when I bought, I bought one and I opened it up and I just sort of went, oh, it's so cute. I mean, it's so cute. And we're also, you know, cuteness matters to us. We respond to cuteness. So here's this little cute thing. So I started out, um, Alexa has an I'm bored feature. So I started out with this Echo Dot. And I said, I, I, first of all, I lied about my age. I lie about my age all the time um, online. It's a good habit to get into, right? <laughs> right, exactly. I'm 13, I'm seven, I'm six, I'm two, whatever. So I, I lied about my age. I was a four-year-old. So, so I said, Alexa, I'm bored. And what came back at me were basically four or five ads for products. Every single um, activity that Alexa suggested to me was a product. The American Girls, Pokemon, you know, whatever. The, and so the, the, I mean, and and, you know, I don't know what Amazon's relationship is with these products, but I would guess that they're being paid. I mean, you know, to be prominent in what Alexa is suggesting. So that was bad enough. Um, and and concern because of my how much I care about creativity, and I it that you know that's not a good solution to I'm bored. And in fact, you know, the, one of the best answers to I'm bored is why don't you take some time and see if you can figure out something that you'd like to do. Um, so, which Alexa does not say, 
by the way. Um, but then um, I have a chapter in my book about, um, about bias and about racism. And I had been reading about the racism embedded in search engines. And so I, um, I woke up one morning and I thought, you know, Alexa is a search engine. I wonder what Alexa has to say about race. So you have to ask Alexa a question. So I went to my little Echo Dot and I said, Alexa, what are African-American girls? And Alexa said, African-American girls are the fastest growing segment of the juvenile justice system. I was, honestly, I nearly fell off my chair and I asked again and I got the same answer. And, and so, so then, up. pardon? I just said, it's so messed up. It's so, it's so messed up. And, and then I said, well, African American, I said, well, Alexa, what are African American boys? And it said, it was a little garble. It said, they're boys and they're African American. And some of them have trouble with learning and reading. So basically, Alexa told the child I was pretending to be that African American kids are either bad or stupid. So I, I, I videoed it, I got it on video because I honestly didn't think anybody was ever gonna believe me that this really happened. Um, the, and, and, and when we talk about, about um, bias and technology, we, all, we often talk about the digital divide and how, what a problem that is. And it is a problem, but another huge problem is the racism that is embedded in big data. I mean, and, and it's big data that provides Alexa with its answers or provides Google if you do a Google search. And, and the big data, um, it, it, the, it, it, it come it, it's it's embedded with bias because we live in a biased culture. We live in a biased world. And so um, so that's why um, you know that that explains Alexa's answer. It doesn't justify it. But there's also bias, our inherent bias that we all have, including the people who are creating the algorithms that are driving the, um, the search engines that are driving what turns up online. And the companies, you know, they're not, um, they're not doing prevention around this. What happens, and this is what happened with um, my discovery about Alexa, is if somebody raises the issue to the company, the company will fix that issue, but it doesn't solve the lot larger problem. And you know what we have is Amazon, um, you know, saying that Alexa could help. You know, is good for helping kids with homework. You know, you could ask. You know, ask Alexa anything. Alexa will provide you with in, with information but it's um, biased information and there's no way to counter it either. And that's the difference. I mean, certainly, you know, librarians, teachers, we, we all have biases, but if it's coming from an actual person, you can ask questions, you can counter it. And, and you can't do that if it's just coming from a, a machine. I mean, that was, you know, really horrible. And if you go to um, Amazon right now and say, what are African-American girls? Uh, it's a completely different answer. And that is because um, Time Magazine excerpted um, that part of my book. And um, before they published the piece, well, yes, but before they published, published the piece, they gave Amazon time to change it. They got in touch with Amazon. They said, this is coming out. And so 
um, Amazon fixed it. And, you know, the last I checked for all the races and ethnicities that I tried, uh, the answers, you know, were pretty reasonable, but they didn't do it on their own. Yeah, this is one of the really impressive and important things about your book is it is really incredibly detailed and super well researched. I mean, you've actually kind of, you know, gone um, into um, the uh, the snake pit <laughs> and you've, the dark you've, side. Yeah, you've you've looked at the leaked memos. You've looked at the communications that the marketers have with each other at their conventions. You go to advertising conferences. You you've gotten sort of inside to see what is actually happening. And I have to say, um, it is the cynicism of just pushing the bottom line on children is really disturbing. Which is why we're going to be sure we save time to talk about. Um, what we all can do and um, about successes. One of the other examples you give um, that is sort of related to this experience of children being quashed, whether it's having uh, their positive cultural, ethnic, and racial identities um, uh, uh, quashed or their socioeconomic status quashed is the prodigy uh, program that so many schools have adopted um, where you go into some depth about that, but I thought maybe if you, if you talked a little bit about the how prodigy harms children and sells um, itself as if it were teaching math, but doesn't really, that that could then lead us into uh, where some of the places are that that we can all act. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe, I mean, there may be better examples, but that's one that, that I remember right off the top of my head from the yeah, book. Yeah, it's it's for, it's not hopeless. Um, it's hard, but it's not hopeless. And I think that's really important. Um, so Prodigy is this math, quote, math game. Um, and, and one of the things that the, the tech industry is doing is pushing really, really hard to get into schools. Um, and Prodigy um, is, is this game that allegedly teaches math, but basically what it is, it's like um, Fortnite. It's like like these pop or Minecraft, these popular sandbox games where there are duels, and you you get to fight a um, you're you're a wizard, and you get a really cute pet, and you know, and all of that, and. Um, and when I first started looking at, at Prodigy, what I noticed is that the math was just kind of dropped in. And, and I, I sent the game to a, a friend and colleague of mine who is, um, is a math teacher and taught teachers math. And, and there's nothing in the game that, that really helps you understand the concepts that you're allegedly learning. And also the message to kids is math is so boring that it has to be couched in this game in order, you know, it's like, you know, applesauce for a pill or something like that. And, and um, in the couple of years that I was writing the book, Prodigy developed and eventually what happened is that kids could connect to other kids and what they what they're doing, Prodigy, is it, it's it's what's called a freemium, which is what Minecraft is and and Fortnite is, where the game is advertised as free and you can play it, but it's not as fun or exciting as the version you know where you actually buy things or the the premium version um, is, and so. Like in in um, in Prodigy, I haven't looked at it in a while. But the last time I looked, the kids whose parents could afford the premium version were able to fly, and the kids whose parents couldn't afford or chose not to buy the premium version were kind of slogging along on the ground, or you know they didn't have as fancy things or and that's you know what happens in Fortnite where you can buy skins to decorate your avatar and things like that 
Um, and, you know, they, the, the companies, I mean, they call these games, these multiplayer games, they call them sandbox games, but it's not really like a sandbox because in a sandbox, there's nobody, um, aside from the rules of safety, there's nobody dictating your play. It, it's not mediated by a corporation the way that these sandbox games are. And the purpose of the games is to make money. It's not to promote child development. I you think know, we really have to look at ed tech. And honestly, um, there are exciting things that kids, that older kids can do online. But I, I've never seen anything for babies, toddlers, preschoolers, kindergartners um, that that they couldn't do just as well or better um, in in a hands-on world. I mean, except possibly, and this is this is really um, interesting to me that when the new technologies came out, you know, where you could swipe and tap and do all of that. Um, the way that the companies and the people, the, the early childhood people who were embracing the new technologies were saying is television is so passive, but these games, these are active. These are interactive. Television is passive. Well, you know, the games that I've played, especially for young children, they're not active. They're, they're not even interactive, really. They're reactive. The choices the kids have are limited or really they stifle creativity. Um, and and um, in fact, they're, they're like a, a good movie for a preschooler or, or a, you know, a, a good story. Certainly, you know, um, books are more creative you know, or, or encourage creativity more than what's on a screen. But a good movie or, or a really good, thoughtful television program actually is not um, passive. It is interactive. It's emotionally interactive. It's cognitively inter interactive. The problem with most of what's on screens today, there's a lot of good stuff for kids, say, on PBS. But the problem is that even those programs are financed through brand licensing. So basically, they're selling a lot of junk toys, often to low-income kids, in order to support their programming. And um, and that's uh, for me, that's the real problem with um, with television and movies today for kids. I mean, the content. There's a lot of perfectly fine content not for babies and toddlers who really can't gain anything beneficial from a screen, but for, you know, slightly older kids, including preschoolers. The problem is, you know, that um, they're the even good programs are tools for selling kids junk. You know, there's one a comment about um, how do you, <laughs> How do you undo the damage for older kids and sort of get them unaddicted? And there's another comment um, that this is really disheartening because so many parents buy these products thinking they are supporting their children when their funds could be uh, spent in so many more enriching ways. And so I think um, we should move to what we all can do. And you do have, uh, I think the next to last chapter is um, in um, Who's Raising the Kids is called resistance parenting and it's about what parents can do as individuals but you're very careful to say the the new and the future digital technology tools are so powerful that um we shouldn't be um burdening parents with protecting their children all by themselves so um maybe you can tell us about a couple of success stories i know there was one where um, you were able to get in early and stop Mattel from having its Aristotle project become a um, surrogate parent, essentially. And then I know there's another um, uh, another effort in um, Acton Boxborough, right nearby us in Massachusetts, uh, which has helped sort of keep um, 
quote unquote ed tech out of education. And, and, mm -hmm. and you also, I think, probably have all kinds of other um, ideas about what we all can do mm -hmm. um, that will help uh, rehearten us after hearing how disheartening this is. Yeah, um, this this is not a, a, a family problem. It's not a parenting problem. It's a societal problem. And really, society needs to fix it. Um, and uh, that's why I and my colleagues founded um, Campaign for Commercial Free Childhood, which is now called Fair Play. I, um, I left Fair Play in, um, let's see, 2015, and I, I am so thrilled at what they're doing. That it's, they're doing just an incredible job um, raising awareness, but also stopping some of the worst of what corporations are doing. And one of the things that Fair Play did is um, take on Mattel's Aristotle, which was supposed to be this device that screen device that would grow with a child. So it would sing lullabies to a baby again, replacing, you know, parents, it would tell stories to younger kids, you know, preschoolers, and then you, it would help kids with homework. Um, the good news is that um, Fair Play found out about that Aristotle before it ever came on the market and did, you know, a lot of publicity about what the harms were. And, um, and Mattel never released it. I mean, that was a really big one. But also, Fair Play still works with the FTC, files, has filed a lot of um, Federal Trade Commission complaints against, including one against Google that really changed um, YouTube for kids, you know, that, you know, could not have autoplay, for instance, where, you know, you, it just keeps making suggestions and things like that. So, you know, as I said, I think earlier, this is a social justice issue and it take it takes activist groups it's activist groups and the people who support the activist groups and who work um, with activist groups i think that really are going to make a difference and one thing that's very exciting um is that that there are bills in congress today that have um that have um, support from both sides of the aisle, which is really, really unusual. There's one called the Kids Online Safety Act, which has um, 48 senators um, are supporting that bill. That's what they've got so far. I mean, they're gonna need more, but that's pretty amazing. And interestingly enough, it's split evenly um, between the Democrats and the Republicans. I mean, I think that's really impressive. So I do urge you um, to look at, at Fair Play, fairplayforkids.org, but also they have um, a, a, a network, a screen time action network that works with a lot of small organizations which are springing up all over the country addressing um, issues around screen time. And that's really exciting. I mean, that's changed since I first began with Campaign for Commercial Free Childhood when there were hardly any organizations doing anything then. There's a lot going on and I think that's important. The thing is though, that, that social change, it's hard to make that change and it takes time and parents need help as well. And so I do have a whole chapter that's devoted to things that parents can do um, across ages. Um, the, you know, the, the easiest thing is to start when babies, you know, with babies and really postpone as long as you possibly can, possibly aside from, um, video chatting with adults who love them, but really, you know, avoid using screens with very young children as long as you possibly can. They're not particularly useful. And the danger is, and they're so seductive. I mean, 
five minutes with the screen, 15 minutes with the screen, it's not going to hurt a baby or a toddler. But the problem is that it never just stays at 15 minutes. It's, you know, it's so, um, the screens are so seductive. And for parents, um, you know, the, the fact that they can occupy their baby so easily and then go on and do other things, I mean, that's a big selling point. But the problem is that what happens is that the kids just won't learn how to soothe and amuse themselves. And so they're they're like always going to be dependent on the screens. So that's, you know, that's the easiest thing is to start, you know, when kids are born, really, to be thinking about that. But there are things that you can do with older kids. And one of them is um, we have to watch our, our own time with screens. I mean, and um, that's a problem. Kids model what they see. But also you can carve out times in your family life that are screen free. That's another possibility is to um, meals, screen free meals, which is, you know, that meal, family meals are a time when kids learn about conversation or about how, how about finding out things about the family or about uh, family history or things like that. So carve out times when all of you, including um, the adults, you know, don't have screens. Some some families, when everybody gets home at night, um, you know, they have a place where everybody puts their phones. Um, so that's that's something that you can do. You know, try to carve out. Uh, families are carving out at least one night a week where they're not, um, where there aren't any screens and where you do something that you all enjoy doing, whether, who knows, it's a puzzle, it's a hike, it's, you know, it's a walk in the neighborhood, it's something, you know, that you can do um, together. Um, so, so um, it's harder with older kids, and it's it's especially hard now because the schools are so tied into technologies, and the kids are using, um, they're using you know their computers for homework, but they're also using them for social media, which that's a whole other conversation. So, um, <laughs> I understand. I understand the difficulties, but I, I just don't want people to feel that they're completely helpless because, you know, you're not. You know, you you gave one um, very concrete little tip in the book, uh, which was, you know, many of us struggle with our own addiction with our smartphones. And um, you're um, not at all judgmental of that. You kind of own your own. Yeah. And, right. And you say one thing you can try is every time you reach for your phone when you're with your children, to say out loud, here's why I'm, I'm here's what I'm looking for on my phone right now, to sort of create your own awareness of um, why you actually did that, and to help your children have some way of understanding why you sort of pulled out of the interaction. The other thing you're reminding me of, your book is just so full of what I think we all need to know. You you cite this research that says that in this effort to get iPads into the hands of every kid in public schools. There now is data that says that the kids who have you know iPads for all their work are learning less well and doing less well even on standardized tests than kids who don't have iPads. So um, part of I think our struggle is to have our own critical thinking restored when we're being um, sold uh, things in the name of education or our children's happiness um, that actually do um, just the opposite. I, I think we are now in our last minute when it's time for me to thank you, first of all, for the gift of your presence and wisdom today, also for um, the incredible research um, that went into this really important book, as well as for the struggle that you've been in for decades now for all of our children. Thank you so much, Susan Lynn, and I hope you all We'll come back again on Wednesday, December 13th at 3 p.m. Eastern for our next Learning to Listen episode. 
that one will be a first for us. It will be about a new documentary film called Imagining the Indian, the fight against Native American mascotting. We've been talking about the harm to kill children's cultural, ethnic, and racial uh, identity development. Well, that's what this film is about too. And we will be joined by filmmakers, uh, indigenous filmmakers, Ben West and Yancey Burns, and psychologist Amy West, and, they'll, and we'll find out why native mascots are so harmful to all children, how pervasive native mascots are in schools across the country, and what we all can do about it. To learn more about and register for more Browse and Touchpoint Center conversations, events, and trainings, click on the browseandtouchpoints.org link in the chat to join our learning network. You'll find a link in the chat now for the learning network. And if you are able and would like to help us continue to make programming like Learning to Listen free and available to all, please look for the donate link in the chat or the donate page at the browsefromtouchpoints.org website. We are so glad to have you all with us today for this very important story. And remember, you will be able to uh, find the recording in the email that comes to you tomorrow and uh, on our browsefromtouchpoints.org website in the uh, conversation section. Thank you all for being with us. And again, thank you, Susan Lynn. Thank you.